Welcome back. Here we are looking at descriptive statistics and look at the title here. Measures of spread or how dispersed the data is. Measures of spread or how dispersed the data is. And the story continues. People do not like to look at big tables of values like this. They say, honey, what does that mean? And uh, what do we do? Well, we can draw the histograms like we've got here or we can calculate statistics that is give them an idea of the center maybe the mean the median or the mode from our last presentation and now what do we want to do we want to try and give them some idea of the spread of the distribution so let's embark on that journey this time round and have a look at what we can do the first most obvious measure of spread is the range. It's the difference between the largest and the smallest. It's this one here, minus this one here, and you come up with a single number. Let's say 120 centimetres or something. So that is the range. It is actually the difference between the two. You don't put from uh, such and such to such and such. Can you see the difficulty with the range? I've got a different sort of distribution here. This is a skewed distribution. So this one might have a range of 140 centimetres. But there's only a few really up here. So is that change really what we want to uh, use to indicate the different ranges of these two sets of data? And I guess this one down the bottom is even worse. That's a 140 centimetre gap as well. But gee, it wouldn't be 140 centimetres if it wasn't for that bundle up there. We actually call them outliers, and we usually don't include them in data, but I'm going to discuss that with you a bit later on. But you can see the range is problematic. It does not tell you about how many are distributed over that particular range of uh, scores. So we say the range is a non-resistant, it does not resist, non-resistant measure of spread. Non-resistant. So therefore if there's skewness, it will give you quite an erroneous reading. It will give people the idea that the data is quite spread when perhaps it isn't. So have you got that one? Let's look at some more. And... Um, here we are, the interquartile range and measures of non-central tendency. So this is when there's skewness and so on. How do we handle it? Well, let's look at this term, the interquartile range. Now, before we do that, you better get an idea of what a quartile is, or a percentile and a quartile. First of all, you put the data in ascending order, going up, smallest to largest. And then we divide it up into hundredths, percentile, percent. So the 90% percentile is the score that has 90% of scores below it. Score that has 90% of all scores below it. Okay. And there's 10% therefore above it. So it can be anything, P percent. So the 80% percent percentile is the score that has 80% of the people below it. Okay, that's the idea. Um, let's have a look then at the first quartile. Well, quartile, of course, means the first quarter or the 25% percent percentile. It's got 25% of the observations below it. So how do you do it? Well, you usually add the number of scores, so the number of scores you add one, and then find a quarter of it. Okay, so that gives you a number of the score, which will be the marker for the bottom 25% of scores. So notice the percentiles and quartiles are actual scores, refer to the actual scores and their position in cutting up a diff distribution of scores. Okay, what about the median? Well, that's the middle number, isn't it? So there's 50% percent percentile, or the second quarter of scores, if you like. Okay, so we did a bit of that before, finding the middle score, <coughs> M plus one on tooth score. And then if it was 
an even number of scores halfway either side, if you remember that from the previous presentation. So uh, this, that was the medium. The third quartile is the one, three lots of 25% is 75%. So this is a 75% percentile. And it, we usually take three quarters of the M plus one value and take that score as measuring three quarters up the distribution. Now we're going to practice that later on. It's a matter of getting used to the, the, that, that sort of jargon in dividing up the distribution. Let's come down and have a look at doing one. So over here I've taken some screen clippings from Pearson's again. And usually what we do with quiz quartiles, first of all, split it into two halves at the median. Okay, so what have we got here? Uh, this is uh, three, four, five, seven scores. So there's an exact second quartile or median. Okay, n plus one on tooth is seven plus one on two. It's the fourth score. So that's the medium. Uh, it's a half on either side. Then the first half here, write it down in n is odd, so in, let's include the median there. And now the first quartile is the middle or the median of that bottom quarter. Okay, do you get it? Halfway in between there. And so here it's 4.5. So that's Q1, the score that splits the bottom quarter away, or halves the bottom quarter, if you like, uh, halves the bottom half. Now let's write out the top half, including the median. And if we do that, to find the upper quartile, we'll go in the middle here, which is, again, 5.5 so that's Q3 upper and lower quartile so that's another way of looking at it that you're trying to divide the distribution up into quarters to have a look at the spread if you like and the evenness of that spread uh, within your data set okay let's go down and have a look at a measure here that we use now you can see here that if you look at Q1, the bottom 25% down there, and then you've got the median in the middle, then you've got Q3, and that's the top 25%, or marking off the bottom 75%, we call this the interquartile range, the middle 50%. And now this isn't a bad measure if you've got skewness because where they might taper away, let's have something here, taper away, if you take the middle quarter, uh, sorry, the middle half between Q1 and Q3, that's going to alleviate the distorted vision that you get by taking the whole range, by overemphasizing those. So here we have the new one, interquartile range is Q3 take Q1, Let's look at this set of heights here of people and see how it works. Now there are 25 scores here. So 25, N is 25. So the median is N plus one on tooth score. Nothing to do with dentistry. Uh oh, small joke. So this is 25 plus one on two or the 13th score. So let's count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So that one sixty seven is the median. Okay. Now let's look at the bottom half of scores now. So up to there there are thirteen scores, and if we can't consider that in the bottom half, we need the seventh score. One, two, three, four, five. Six. Now, it'll be actually halfway between these two here. Halfway between those two, the middle score there. So this will be Q1, which will be 163. 
Let's try it on the top end and going halfway between that top 12. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Halfway between in there is 173.5. That'll be Q3, halfway through the top set of 12. OK, because here the middle one is actually the 13th. There's 12 above and 12 below, so we've got to find the middle of those. Uh, do you get it? So what's the interquartile range? The interquartile range of this data is 173.5, take 163, which is 10.5. Do you think that gives a reasonable measure of spread? Because, oh yes, here's a few have gone a bit wayward here. There's a, a few very high scores. Now we're cutting out the effect of those by just taking the middle 50%. And so we say the IQR is also a, is a resistant measure of spread. It resists the effect of skewness. Okay. Okay, it's a resistant measure of spread. It's not going to be put off so much like the ranges come over here by a few tapering up scores like that. So this is very handy if you've got skewed data to actually give people a better idea of what the distribution looks like without overreacting to a few high or low scores. OK, let's keep going and build up this idea now. So here we are. A five-number summary is something we often use to describe sets of data. You'll see why in a minute. You take the minimum. So let's, let's write it down for this set of data. So min x, as it would be on the calculator, and we'll show you how to do that in a minute, is 154. Q1 was 163, we just worked these out. The median was 167, Q3 was 173.5, and the max X was 205. So we've done our five number summary by hand here for this set of height data. Now what's this about? A box and whisker plot. Well, that's a very good statistical graph to indicate the breakdown of the data according to the five number summary. I'm going to try and draw one for you on screen. It's a bit hard on screen, but I want you to go with me now. What's the first step? The first step is to draw a horizontal line. Here we go. That's not too bad a line from screen. And to now put on a scale. So the scale, it goes from 154, so let's start at 150, and it's got to end up at just over 205. Let's go to 210, let's say. So we'll go up in fives, 155, 160. 165, 170. 175, 180. This should be done on graph paper. 185, 190. 195, 200. 205, 210. So it's a proper scale. And you should also mark what it is, its heights. And uh, heights in centimetres. OK, so the first step is to set up a scale working from your min to your max. OK, so the next step is to plot the... Uh, quarters, five number summary, 163. So there's 163 about there. So up here, we'll just put a little mark. Then the median, 167. Oh, that's just in here somewhere. Okay, so we'll make a little mark there. 167. Q3, 173.5. About here, reading off from this scale, that's 175. And the max is 205, right up here. OK, and we put a little mark for the min as well. What we do now is to make a box in this middle 50%. So let's rule, that has to be ruled up there. 
ruled line and let's draw a line here okay and up the top this should all be ruled and we'll just get it right here now okay a bit hard on screen so that's got to be a perfectly ruled box there and these are straight lines at the right point now we've got our whiskers out the end which shows the bottom quarter and the top quarter so we join them up now through here okay so there's our box plot that's not a very good one because this whisker should be in the middle of the box so we should actually make it a bit better than that so we try and make it a bit better come down here to there and down a bit but remember it should all be ruled can't do that on screen too well okay more like that okay so we call that a box and whisker plot okay and I think we've gone too far down here let's just get rid of that 154 is about there I think okay I've messed up my line here now okay a box and whisker plot it consists of a box for the middle 50 percent between q1 and q3 and this is a whisker or two whiskers one on either end so you can see how from this box plot you can see that the distribution is not uh, symmetrical this whisker is longer so it's sort of suggesting here there's some skewness on the positive side skewness positively and we saw that with these few pieces of data here really going high off to one end now this is a very important statistical graph now in this IB score of course all this measures of central tendency should be able to be done by hand and, and so should a box plot but they do embrace the use of technology so we'll have a look at that in a minute okay so do you get the idea of how to draw this graph and you can see here the length of the box is the interquartile range and the, that measure there is the median so you see it's not in the box right in the center of the box so even this uh, look larger piece here is suggesting a bit of skewness off to the right as well because that median is not in the center of the box okay well let's have a look now at um, going on and doing a bit more with this sort of plot okay and here we are you can do it on the calculator so let's enter the data into one of the lists go to stat mode execute and come to that so we enter our data now I'm sorry we've entered our data back at the first one then we've got to choose graph by hitting F1 and now we come to this screen here okay and you can see the options here down the bottom so we've got to choose set by hitting F6 so we're going to set up we've done this in earlier presentation with histograms and there you are our choice is still there so stat graph one well let's leave that we're going to scroll down with this key here and highlight histogram okay and if we do that and go to the next window we go to the next set of options which includes histogram but this is one we want we want the box plot so hit f2 and med box meaning a box with a medium marked in the middle is listed check we want to work with list one and each one has a frequency so scroll down until look at this i've scrolled down with this key until outliers off i'm going to push or select on by hitting f1 outliers on and you don't know about outliers yet but we'll come up to that in a minute so hit f1 and then execute and we're back to this window all right so we've just defined graph one as a box plot a med box okay so if you hit gra graph one then sorry we'll just come up here a bit if you select graph one by hitting f1 then we will have this screen here now you can see they've done something 
outliers are on, and that's these little marks here indicate outliers. These are now quite clearly data points that lie outside the main body of data. Now we're going to define that again in a minute. But that's interesting that the calculator has on board a program which will show according to their system, and there's several different systems for detecting how far away from the body of data must an outlier be before you outcast it, if you like, if you, before you call it an outlier. Okay, well, let's now have a look at this data. So let's choose Shift and F1 because that brings in Trace. Oh, here's our tracer, pops on board now. And pops on the first value and reads out min x. So hey, if they give you a set of data and they don't tell you you have to do it by hand, put it into list one or list two or somewhere there, draw the box plot and then copy it onto your paper. Eh? Because now, if you scroll using this button across, where's it pop next? On to Q1. It gives you all the statistics you need from that set of data. Remember, statistics are value cal values calculated on a sample that tell you information about the data. And you can keep coming across and get all the key points which you then put relative to your scale. But you must label the scale. This scale is not labelled here and that will cost you marks. You must make it a clear statistical graph. Okay. So if you exit that then, and exit it twice, come to this screen, and then uh, to this one, um, then uh, I, think, I think I've just made a mistake there. I think you do have to hit graph again. Yes, you have to get graph again, sorry, to get out of that. So hit exit and then graph F1. Come back to this screen. And what I'm looking to pick up is that there, one there. What's that doing there? Okay, so if we choose that by hitting F1, ah, that's what it is. It gives us that set of data that we saw, set of statistics, sorry, that we saw from our set of data back in the measures of central tendency. And if you scroll down, you've got them all. Let's look at what you've got. You've got the mean, you've got some other things here. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll want to use those again you know, later on. And then you've got your five-number summary if you scroll down. 154, 163, 167, there it is. They were the five numbers which summarise the cutoffs into quarters of our data set and gives us our box plot. OK. So, there's some tricky do ways here. You don't have to handle the raw data without technology unless they make you. Put in the calculator and everything comes on board. Fantastic little uh, cal calculator, this Casio 9860 Plus. Okay, come on down and let's talk about these outliers. These little creatures that the calculator has determined through its own rule, these are lying too far out from the data set. Okay, scores which lie outside the main, this is not a bad definition, the main body of data. And there are various tests. Please keep in mind on the Casio, the test that they use is a little bit different uh, from uh, the one that's required in the IB. Let's have a look at the one required in the IB. In the IB, the rule is you take Q3, if you're looking at upper outliers like we are here, and add 1.5 times the interquartile range. And if it exceeds that, if it's too far, then it will be called an outlier. Okay, and if it's less on the other end than Q1, so that's Q3, you can't go too far past that under this rule. And if you go too far the other way, Q1 take 1.5 lots of the interquartile range, then that will be considered an outlier. So what are your steps? Steps number one, find IQR, which is the length of the box, Q3 take Q1. Number two, times it by 1.5. That's by the IQR. And then to get our fence, as Pearson's talk about, Q3 plus that value, 
for the upper fence, for Ghost Barsat, it's an outlier, and Q1 Miners. So you're allowed to go from the end of the box one and a half box lengths, if you like. And if they go beyond that, they're going to be called outliers. Now, can you see them on the histogram? Yeah, they're just bundled up here somewhere, lying out from the main body of data. Can you see it on the data set itself? Well, they've got four, so they're saying 186 just makes it. Just makes it in. 190, 195, 198, 205 don't. Shall we check that and see if that obeys the IB rule? Because the Casio has designated them as outliers. Let's see if they fit the rule. Okay, what was our Q1? Our Q3, sorry, because on the upper end. Our Q3 here was 173.5. Our interquartile range, do you remember what it was? Um, what was it? It was 173.5, take 163. Okay, did we work that out for this set of data? Not sure, but that's 10.5. So it was, um, what, 173.5, Q3 minus Q1, Q1 was 163. The interquartile range is 10.5. 1.5 times the interquartile range. What's that? 1.5. One and a half times this one um, is 15.75. Uh, so is it 15.75? I think so. Okay, one and a half times that. Yep, so that's 15.75. So the upper limit, or the upper fence if you like, the upper limit of the body of data not to be considered an outlier is uh, what was our top end uh, of our thing 173.5 top end of the box Q3 plus 15.75 is what 179 is it one uh, oops no not 179 189.25 189.25 Yep Okay, so we can see that actually over here 86 is okay That's under 189.25 But the other four scores are not Okay Now What do you do with outliers? Well, the interesting thing that outliers, if they're seen, if they're deemed to be errors, um, if an outlier implies an error, we usually discard it. Discard, but investigate what went wrong. Investigate the error. If an outlier is not an error, we usually incorporate it in the data, but notice the effect. Always observe the effect of these few high scores. But quite often, this is what we do statistically, discard them. And there's a terrible, terrible story about discarding an outlier. Back in the last two decades of the 20th century, when they were doing atmospheric testing over the southern hemisphere with balloons, they found that they had a very low ozone reading and they deemed it to be an outlier and it was an error, they thought, and they discarded it. Lo and behold, many years later, they should have investigated it, I think, many years later we find that it was a true measurement and it actually got worse. So one should, okay, discard it if you think it's an error, but check, observe what the effect is going to be, because that was a devastating omission. That people, nobody followed it up as such. Okay, have you got the idea? Outliers. Now, this is the rule the IB wants you to use. There are various other statistical rules, but this is the one we use. You can't go more than one and a half interquartile ranges above or below the end of the box. Okay, think about that. You'll get a chance to practice it as we go on. So it's building up in complexity, isn't it? And of course, there's another way of getting our uh, quartiles. And we could use a cumulative frequency diagram here. So 
So this is the frequency or cumulative frequency up here from the old expense data that we're talking about before in euros. So there are 80 students, the bottom quarter are 20, and approximately the Q1 is 50. Obviously, when you're drawing a graph like this, you are doing it only approximately because we don't know how squiggly these lines should be. The median is half of 80, is the 40th score. Approximately, it looks like about 54. And then the upper quarter, if you like, three quarters of 80 is 60, leaving 20 upper quarter there, and that score is 60. So we can do all of them. Q1 is approximately 50. The median, or Q2, is approximately 54. And Q3 is approximately 60. So we can do that approximately from a cumulative frequency graph. So there's lots of ways now, as we lose the data, as we move away from the data to other representations and to some statistical calculations, we're getting a big picture, a description, if you like, descriptive statistics of the state, aren't we? The state of the situation. Well, right, let's come to another one. And this one is another measure of how data varies and uh, deviates away from values. This is called the standard deviation. And the variance is the square of that. Okay, so the population standard deviation is given a Greek symbol. And here it is. It's the sum of every member of the population measured or its square of its distance away from the population mean for every item. And then we've averaged it. It's the, uh, it's the square in the bracket here. Let's put it down in, in words. It's the square root of the mean of the squares of the deviations from the mean. Isn't it? Get a score, take it away from the actual population mean, square it, add them all up, average them by the way how many there are and then take the square root and this of course can be done on the calculator just in list one it's one of the statistics here i'll refer to this in a minute the sample standard deviation is the same idea you're adding up a small n so it's not the whole population you, you're taking away the um, sample mean here and this really should be n take one but what the IB has decided to do in all tests and so on is to treat your sample as if it's the whole population. As if it is the whole population. Now, usually we use n take 1 in here because of the estimation that has to go on between a sample sand deviation and a population sand deviation. Degrees of freedom. It's beyond the um, uh, breadth of this course. But here you are, you must use your sample as if it is the whole population. So what does that mean over here? Sigma x is the one you need. Sigma x on the calculator, we'll use division by n. Sx would be division by n take 1. And for this course, we're not doing that. OK? The premise that the um, IB are under here, when, they are give you, when you're given any data, we're not doing inferential statistics. We're taking that group of data as it, as the whole population. So then we're going to use sigma. OK? We use that one for this course. All right, okay. So you can get it from the calculator by entering the data as before. And where we just plucked out the mean, now we have a standard deviation. And you can see what it's doing. It's trying to measure the average deviation of scores away from the mean. That's another way of measuring spread from some central point, isn't it? Okay, well, let's have a look then down here. And Pearson's gone to a lot of trouble, and this is outside the course. Outside the course, there is an explicit mention in the course that you will only have to find the standard deviation by using technology. So what are you going to do? Right, well, you could have your group data, the midpoint, and you might still need 
this midpoint to find the mean. Now, that's something we haven't done before. Look out for this. If you have group data, you've lost the original scores, you estimate them with the midpoint. This is in the course. If you're finding the mean of a set of data, and that data is grouped, you've lost the actual value, you assume all the numbers in that group are all midpoints. So we've got three in this group, but they're all 42.5. 11, you have to do that. It's an estimate, but you've lost the data. So you're going to assume they're equally spread, if you like, throughout the group. Therefore, you can consider them as all midpoint values. And then you, what do you do? The midpoint value times how many there are, add them up, and divide by 80. So you must, you must be able to do this by hand without technology. Estimating the value within a group as a midpoint. This is what's not in the course. You don't have to do the variance and the standard deviation. Please note that the variance is equal to sigma squared. It's, it's before you take the square root, if you like. So the standard deviation is the square root. The variance is the square of that. No square roots, I know. So please get on track with this. And the course is very specific about this. You must be able to use the original data and the frequency notation here, sum of all the frequencies times the value and divide by how many there are to calculate the mean by hand, like this table is done, using the midpoint but not for the sand deviation. Have you got it? You'll get a chance to practice shortly. Okay, come down and let's have a look at this um, standard deviation formula. Okay, let's have a look at these two distributions. This one up here is basically symmetrical. The mean, median and mode will probably all be somewhere there with no skewness, basically. Let's see if we, if we can measure the spread around here. This might just give you some insight into the idea of this formula. So we're going to try and measure the spread of scores here away from the mean. But hang on, if I add up just xi, so this is xi, any score, minus x bar, over here, because it's symmetrical, this xi minus x bar, this will be a positive value and there will be a matching negative value. So if I keep doing this for a symmetrical distribution, I'll get wipe out. Every positive deviation plus a negative would give you an overall zero de deviation. So this would be no good. Okay? Because it would be approximately zero in a symmetrical distribution. Some would be positive, some would be negative. So shall we, shall we square them? Shall we square the deviations on either side? Yep. Then a plus two deviation and neg two deviation wouldn't work, that wouldn't cancel themselves out. They both come to two squared and neg two squared come to four. All right, are you with it? Let's then average those deviations. So we have a mean of the squares of the deviations. But uh, that's too big. We want an idea a, of an average single score deviation away from the mean. Well, let's take the square root of it. So can you see a possible way of looking at the evolving of this formula? That's a, that's a way of just having a go and seeing if you can get your head around that. Now, down here, I've got a non-symmetrical distribution. Uh-oh. Do you think the standard deviation would be valuable here? Well, hang on, I don't think so, because the standard deviation is measuring the deviation away from X bar as the centre, or a mu as a centre. We should be using sigma and mu here, because as I said, the IB asks you to consider your sample in descriptive statistics as not inferring anything beyond that, in, not in this section, but saying that is your whole population. So if it's a whole population, it's mu and sigma for population parameters. So really over here, come over here, I should have had sigma, shouldn't I? And mu there. Okay, because that's what they're saying. Consider your population, your sample there, even if it's relatively small, as a whole population. Well, hang on. Is X bar the centre or mu the centre here? 
No, I don't know. Because of this, when you add on a few high scores, it's going to move the centre up to here. And the centre has been distorted. Because X bar is a non-resistant measure of the centre. So does it make sense in a skewed distribution to measure the standard deviation away from the mean? No, because the mean is not a good centre. It's not a good centre when there's that skewness there. So we usually use sigma or SN for symmetrical distributions because sigma is a non-resistant measure of spread. Non-resistant measure. Why? Because it's based on the mean, which is moving, it's not resistant as a measure of centre. So you're measuring deviations of scores away from the centre that isn't the centre, if you like. Okay, think about that. How's your head going? Okay, let's keep going. You might have to rewind the presentation to get the hang of this. Let's keep going down though. Here we go. Let's play with some actual data here. And this, is, this is where it gets fun. Because you can actually take some figures that you might be interested in and do some work on them. Okay, so this is from Pearson's. I've recorded my car's fuel efficiency over the last 98 times that I've filled the tank. Gee, that's busy. Here's the data expressing how many kilometres per litre the car travelled. There it all is. Very nice. So can you get the mean by hand? Just remember what the mean is. X bar is the sum of the frequency times the score from I equals 1 to N, which would be 98 times, divided by 98. So 1 by 6, 1 by 7, add all these up all the way through and divide by 98. And the mean was actually 9.454. What is that? That is kilometres per litre. I think we might have too many figures of accuracy there, given the accuracy of the data, which was only taken to the nearest 0.5. So maybe three figures, we might have to accept that one, but question that one. OK. What is the sigma? Well, you put that on the calculator. You don't need to do the work the Pearsons are doing there. The median, well, you could put that on the calculator as well. Q1, Q3 in a quarter hour range. Probably all best. You must be able to do the mean by hand, though. That's important. OK, so we're getting somewhere. We've got some statistics to uh, describe this data set. Now let's draw a picture. People love graphs. Uh, for description of uh, large numbers of pieces of data. So here we have a graph. It's pretty symmetrical. Let's have a look. Uh-oh. Oh. Might have some skewness. And what's this little dude doing down here? Uh-oh. OK. Let's have a look at the box plot. Yes. There it is. The star came up with technology there. And that looks like it's an outlier. And, it, and look at this. Look at this above and below the median. That's bigger than this piece here, even without the outlier. So that's what I'm saying here. See the effect of those scores stretching that whisker there? So you can see from a box plot some skewness. It's much easier from a histogram though, isn't it? OK, the histogram shows the distribution is almost symmetric. The possible outlier has little effect on the mean and standard deviation because it's only what, two or three sixes or something in there. That is why the mean and median are almost the same. Looking at the box plot, you see there's an outlier. OK, let's go down and have a look at that. OK, looking at the box plot. I'll just go up here a little bit here. All right, so looking at the box plot. Now, is this considered an outlier? What would it be? Well, it would be the bottom of the box, here it is here, minus 1.5 by 1.625. Uh-oh, uh-oh, Pearson's have made a mistake there. They've taken it from the median. That's a bit naughty. It's not the median. It should have been taken by from the um, Q1. So let's go back up. What was Q1? Q1 was 8.5. So this should have been 8.5 from the bottom of the box, Minus 1.5 by 1.625. 
Now, I think if we do that, it's still it's going to be 2.4... Um, three seven, I think. Eight point five take two point four four is going to be six point one approximately. So six is still an outlier. We just notice that error there. It's from the bottom of the box, not the median. Minus one point five by point six two five. Let's go to the top of the box and add that, and you get up to twelve point six. But there's nothing bigger than 12.6. So there, if it was out here, that would be an outlier. Are you getting the hang of it? How to measure whether a, sc a point score, a data point, lies outside the body of data. That's what, or far enough, an outlier is outside the main body of data. And there are various rules for that, and we're using 1.5 times the IQR, IQR in a quarter mile range off the top and bottom ends of the box. Okay, it's good. We're getting some good information here about this data set. Okay, here's a question for you. What should you be able to tell about a quantitative variable? Quantitative, that's lots of numbers. That's what people don't like, lots of numbers. So they're going to come to you as a budding young mathematician to draw graphs and to calculate things that will help them understand that mass of data. Okay, let's go down and have a look. First of all, you report the shape of its distribution. Let's just go up a bit. I don't want to see that last bit there. Okay, report the shape of its distribution include a centre and spread. Well, here we are. So from the histogram, that's very handy. Okay, we'll do that in a minute. And down here which central measure and which measure of spread. Now, have I been talking a lot? I always talk a lot, mate, about the word resistant. So if a measure of centre or spread resists skewness, then that's the one to use because it won't be as affected and give you the wrong impression of the set of data. So the rules are, if the shape is skewed, report the median and IQR as measures of centre and spread because they are resistant. You may want to include the mean and standard deviation, but that will give you an idea of the skewness. So point that out to people. Why do the mean and standard deviation are larger because they've been, or smaller, because you've got a few larger or smaller values? And of course, people love graphical representation. So a histogram is certainly useful in descriptive statistics. If the shape is symmetrical, you will report the mean and standard deviation. Because later on we'll see uh, how important the standard deviation is in describing a symmetrical or normal distribution. You may report the median or IQR, but they won't be of interest so much because they'll be uh, just supporting the other values. The mean and median should be very close to each other. And people like the mean. They say, what did you get on the average? You've added them all up, so that's a good picture. They aren't always aware that if there's skewness, it isn't a good picture of the centre, like with the heights back there, perhaps. OK, if there are clear outliers, report the data with and without the outliers. OK, customarily, if the outliers represent an error, <laughs> be careful about the ozone effect. Error you usually discard. So it's worthwhile discussing the situation. I have got outliers, and these can be attributed to, and the data looks like this with them, looks like this without them. The differences may be quite revealing about what's going on there. OK, so think, keep in mind, we're getting to be able to do quite a useful statistical analysis in this descriptive statistics. The aim is to collect a, a data, a set of data, and to be able to describe the state, remember, statistics, the state of what's going on there. OK, and we keep going here. All right, records of a large high school show the heights of their students for the year 2006. So they've actually drawn a graph, so that's nice. Which statistics would best represent the data here? Why? Calculate the mean and standard deviation. Develop a cumulative frequency graph. Use your result to estimate Q1, Q3 and IQR. It's going to be an estimate no matter what we do because we don't have the original data set. Are there any outliers? Well, we'll base that on that, won't we? Using our 1.5 IQR rule. 
Okay, we'll use that and work it out. Write a few sentences to describe it. Let's see the answers now to that sort of a problem. All right. Well, first of all, it appears to have outliers because on the bottom end, I think, and it's slightly skewed to the right. Okay. Well, hang on a minute. We'll just go back. Do we agree? Yep. Here we go. Oh, uh, there's the allies on the upper end. Missed them. So here we would be trying to do this. Oh, uh, we've got a bunch here. So it's skewed to the right. It's there. Skewed positively. And it's also got a bunch removed from the main body. So these are out. they appear to be outliers. We have to check that with our rule. Okay, so we agree with that. Let's keep that in mind. To calculate the mean and standard deviation, set up a table. Just remember now, we don't have to calculate the standard deviation by hand. The course says that's only using technology. So we calculate the mean. Now, we have a problem there. I think, oh no, I think they're all single heights rounded off, are they? Yep. No midpoint problem. And we've got number of students at each particular height. So it's a frequency times the score, add them all up and divide by how many they are to get the mean. I'm not going to worry about these uh, columns to work out the harder standard deviation formula. Okay, so how many were there? The sum of the frequency of 1,300 students. And we multiplied their score by how many times it occurred and added them. If given the chance, we'll use technology. I just might do that in a minute. So this is the total divided by the number of people is that. Now, just keep in mind, you could put the data into list one of your calculator. Then when you set up the graph, put the frequency in list two. Okay, so let's just go back up there. We we'll skipped a bit there. I just got to spin back up here. Okay, so into list two, we'll put the frequency there. Okay, so let's just come across here. Um, if we do that, if we do that, we put this to frequency. Okay, that's very, very important. And uh, to make sure that we have the frequency not being one. Okay, let's just pause that there. So coming back there, we would put our frequency into this list. So when you put a setup for X list and Y list, make sure you tell the calculator in that graph mode, or in the one there mode, that the frequency is in list two. Don't leave it as frequency one. Okay, come down and let's keep answering the question. Develop the cumulative frequency graph and first need to develop the cumulative frequency table. Okay, so we've got these two, the frequencies, and we add them up one by one. Because we want the number of, let's take this score down here, 181. How many have we got up to the end of the 181 group? Well, it's 1095. It's all the ones that came before, plus the final 80 that are in that group. So here we go, all of those added, plus the 80 gives this many up to the end of 181 centimetres. So here we are. The cumulative frequency corresponds to any measurement is the number of observations that are less than or equal to that value. So for example, the cumulative frequency to a height of 174 is 285. 50 at 174 and 235 before that. So we have a cumulative frequency table, a lot of work to do that table. And now what we want to do is to draw it. So remember the scale here? This is a bit cockeyed, that, that 169 is there, 171, 173, and I'm not sure where that is actually. No, that might be right. <coughs> I think that's right there. This is 170 in there, 172, 174, etc. <clears throat> so you have to be careful what sort of scale you use for labelling that. Cumulative frequency up here, height here, a smooth curve approximately as best you can. And now we want the median from this. 
1,300 scores divided by 2 is the 650th and 651st. So you could try and take it from here, up here, a bit hard, but we could take it from the table. Uh, so um, here, the 650th, where are we? Cumulative frequency, 650, and the 651st are all in this group. Uh, so it's in the group of 176 centimetres. Because the 650, 651st are both in that group, they're 485 to there, and 665 up to the end of that group. What about Q1? That's a quarter of 301, which is 325th observation. So if you go to the table, there's 285. So the 325th is somewhere in that next group there. So it's going to be 175. Okay, so it has to be that. The 976, three quarters of 1301, is the 976, there's 905 to there, and 1015 there, so the 976 must be a 180 do. Okay, get the idea? So now let's work out the interquartile range. 180 minus 175 is interquartile range of 5 fairly small in a quartile range. So gee, there's a lot of work we can do on this data to get a picture of what's going on. Okay, so to check for outliers, hang on, we'll just go back up here. I don't want you to see what's down there yet. So I'll just come here. So to check for outliers, here we come. We can calculate the lengths of the whiskers if you like. So the lower fence, don't use that myself, the lower limit is the bottom of the box, 175 minus 1.5 by 5, 167.5. It's lower than the last score, so there's no left-hand outliers. No, they're all within it there. Put the picture here. The upper limit is the upper end of the box, plus 1.5 by 5, which is 187.5. So after here, technically anything else, lie too far away from the main body of data, so they're outliers. That's 194 and 196. And that's what's pulled the mean up a bit, because the mean adds all these higher scores on, and so it's, it's non-resistant. It can't resist their effect. It adds them on. So the mean is higher, 177, saying the mean is in there, but the median is more across here. And you can see, if we're choosing a measure of centre, what gives people a better idea? Well, it's the median. Because of these few scores here being added, the mean got moved up. It did not resist the effect there. All right. Can we just summarise what we've found now? Keep in mind there are measures of the centre and measures of spread, how spread out the data is. And spread implies what? Consistency. Okay, if your motor was giving these um, um, kilometres per litre and the spread wasn't much, you'd say it was performing consistently. Okay, something like that. So that spread measures the consistency or grouping of the data around a central measure. So think about that in describing what's going on. Okay, just got one little tidbit for you. It's um, covered in the syllabus. It isn't specifically mentioned by Pearson's. And I'm going to pose a little problem for you and I want you to try to uh, do it. So I'm going to ask you to pause the presentation in a minute. So here's some interesting properties mentioned in the syllabus. Go back to the data on heights. Here it is here, 25 heights. I want you to add five centimetres to each height and look at the effect. Now we'll do this with technology. So I want you to add five each to each of those scores, put in list one and do some calculations. I want you to calculate the mean median mode with technology and the standard deviation and we'll use sigma here. 
because that's what the calculator, what the course suggests, that this n equals 25 samples here, here's our whole population. Now this was the data, this was the set of statistics for that data unchanged. So what I want you to do, there's the mean, and there's the sigma, and there's the median, and the mode is down there as well. Okay, I want you to look at if you add a fixed amount, here it is here, to each data point, what happens to each of those? Okay, so that's the first one, I just lost that again now, but let's do the other one. If you then double every score and look at the same statistics, what do you notice? Okay, so here are the, the statistics, the calculations we're going to do on that data. Now just note here, I've taken this from another book, this is S but we're using sigma, so that's actually N, that won't affect, if you're using sigma treatment as a whole population, then that's N. That won't affect these, uh, these um, changes, or they, these changes won't affect that. So can you see from the mean what, what would happen if you added five to each one? How would the mean be affected? Um, how would the um, median, the mode, all be affected? Okay, so I want you to pause the presentation now and uh, see what you think there. Uh, would happen. I want you to do it on the calculator, all of those changes, and try to summarise it. Okay, what do you think? Can you see what has happened there? Okay, let's go to the formula and see if we can understand it from there. Let's talk about each one of these scores having five added. Okay, so how many extra fives would you have? n times 5 or 5n. So when you add it all up, divide by n, you're going to have an x bar which goes up by 5. And also the median and the mode would go up by 5. What happens to the standard deviation? Well because over here, let's come over here, each of the scores are up by 5, the mean is up by 5, so the actual difference between them will be no change. So the difference between the score and the mean for each score will have no change. Is that what you found? What about doubling every score? Okay, where am I going to put that now? Um, let's just come down a little bit maybe, we've got a little bit of room here I think. So times by two, all the scores are bigger. The X bar will be times by two. The medium will be times by two. The mode will be times by two. Oh, what happened to the standard deviation? Well, let's try and do some maths. X minus X bar. This was doubled and this was doubled. So what have we got? Factorise it, the original deviation from the mean has been doubled, but we square the deviation. Okay, so here's the deviation, our new deviation from the mean, and we square that. Uh-oh, it goes up by a factor of four times. So you can do it mathematically. Now this is explicitly mentioned in the syllabus. The effect of these changes adding a constant or multiplying by a number to a data set, what things change. And maybe it would be good for you to understand why they're changing, like I've tried to describe here. All right, are you ready to practice some skills now? Let's go and have a look at some problems from Pearson's now. I've again split it into um, the measures of spread and dispersion one here in 9.2 and 9.3, uh, whereas question 1 through 6 were in the measure of central tendency section. Okay, so I want you to pause the presentation, have a go. The solutions are as usual down below, so we'll scroll down in a minute and have a look. So there's 7A and B. Let's go and have a look at the rest of C. 
Okay. Question C, uh, Part C, and Question 8. Go to Question 9 now. Nine's a fairly long question. Very important that you work on getting this right carefully. Okay. Interesting way Pearsons have put the table. I'd suggest you just put it straight down the page. The height just going straight down one long height column rather than in small boxes across. They get less confused. They've probably done this to save space. I'll do it like that. Okay, so pause it, have a go, and I'm going to go on now and look at the answers now. So let's have a look. Okay, cool. question seven, can we get it there? Yes, the whole of question seven. Check your reading off. Um, your answers should have been, any graph should be on squared paper. Okay, that's important. Okay. If we then go on and look at the other two now. Question eight there. Nine A, B and C. Let's go to D there, D and E, check your graph, your labels are important, and F, and boy, that was a lot of work, wasn't it? A lot of information there to help us describe the state of that sample, statistics, there it is, and uh, we've got more of a different nature coming on. Uh, with a little bit of modelling and stuff so uh, stick with it you might need to rewind the presentation make some notes, that sort of thing always good to look back on so I hope to catch you in a, f a further presentation but for now cheers from me